Welcome ladies and gentlemen to the dawn of a new era for Formula 1. It is the first time in history that Formula 1 drivers will have to face this paradigm shift where their preparations will be absolutely hindered and skewed. Will they ever adapt to this big rule change that's just come in and could absolutely shake up the future of the sport? That's right. Welcome to the anti-bike era of Formula 1. Welcome to the 2023 Australian GP. This is our preview on the Inside Line F1 podcast and we are absolutely intrigued to see what Formula 1 drivers will actually do if they don't get to ride a bike on the circuit. It's amazing, isn't it, Kunal, that for the first time ever Formula 1 drivers would won't, won't be able to use bikes now. So can they use uh, these little scooters that we've all used in our childhood that tend to hurt our ankle? Is that allowed or not? My goodness when you started this episode I was like now what rule change did I miss given just how many rule changes come while you're asleep while you're taking a shower while you could be you know walking your dog or whatever and I'm like what rule change is this but yeah I I just realized that from the Melbourne GP immediately literally drivers cannot take Uh, mopeds or those electric kick scooters or cycles and they have to do a track walk so f1 is saying if we call it a track walk you better do a track walk and i get this feeling <laughs> that drivers are just going <laughs> to sit in their motor homes they're not going to do a track walk unfortunately track walks take time mind you track walks take around an hour so that's really a silly thing to ban from formula 1 but hey i'll tell you what's not silly uh at least we try not to be too silly at times i i think the silliest thing i've done is not introduce ourselves on the show first so if you're just listening in and wondering who are these two folks well firstly my name is somal arora i'm the host of the indian racing league broadcasts on star sports and i'm joined by kunal shah an fia accredited formula 1 journalist who works for the viaplay network in norway and was also the former marketing head of the sahara force india formula 1 team which is now of course kunal known as the Aston Martin Aramco Cockpit in Formula 1 team or very politely the second best team in Formula 1 and there's something really interesting about one of their drivers that we've just learned actually in the midweek it is and it is none other than F1 stats guru who you hear pretty much every episode on our podcast as well it is none other than F1 stats guru who has found out a fantastic stat It's a stat that has literally blown up on the internet in the last 24 hours that it went live. It's a stat that I think will be read out on the official broadcast. Doesn't matter which territory or language you listen to it on because it is the most epic stat surrounding Fernando Alonso who's taken this season by storm, literally speaking Somil. Why don't you tell us what the stat is? <laughs> I feel so giddy trying to read out this one, but here goes. What's the commonality between Michael Schumacher, Sebastian Vettel, Lewis Hamilton and Kimi Raikkonen? All of them on their 101st Formula 1 podium ended up scoring a Grand Prix win. Recently, Fernando Alonso took his 100th podium and Melbourne could be podium number 101. Are the chickens coming home to roost? Is El Plan on the cards at last? Are we going to see Alonso's first GP win since forever? I can't believe this F1 stats crew has absolutely nailed it Kunal. He could well be next and who other than F1 stats guru to have found it uh, found this stat up. He is going to do an Australian GP stats preview later on in the show so not just it but this but several other kick-ass stats coming up. And to my mind I mean Aston Martin is clearly the talk of the season more so Fernando Alonso at least at the you know start of the season. given that red bull is running away blah 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 you guys know the drill right and to me if we were to look back 12 months and you know that's always you know hindsight and all of that aston martin had a double q1 exit in australia last year now that's the difference 12 months has made to formula 1 to aston martin and to the narrative more importantly kunal 12 months ago aston martin had one of their drivers riding a scooter in the middle of a track and that's not going to happen ever again is it Yeah, you are magic. never going to let the FI go by for this and why not i mean <laughs> I, i mean i'd love to do a track walk you know i've i've seldom or rather i've often wanted to do the track run where the track is open you know after the official sessions for people to go and run in but i think the three times that we wanted to do that it started raining so we did not end up doing the track run and plus 
the track run was at spa which has a lot of elevation changes so i was like i i don't think i'm fit enough to just run up or rouge like that <laughs> uh but anyway uh you know going back to aston martin it could be alonso's uh, 101st podium as we know uh and and you know just the joy in in his mind is so fantastic you know when you see fernando alonso celebrating and come to think of it Aston Martin are joint second with Mercedes in the constructors championship which sounds extremely strange because you know Aston Martin is just clearly been miles ahead but uh Stroll's retirement in Saudi Arabia didn't do them very well and talking of Stroll I mean yes he's you know he's had uh, his pre-season you know biking accident he's he's come back from an injury probably still carrying an injury but he has been beaten in, in you know both qualifying sessions uh you know he has been beaten in in the races as well the talk of the town is fernando alonso uh and it just goes to show even if stroll sort of does a mediocre job he's just expected to be there and be there about scoring points while fernando alonso is winning hearts you know one more time so i'm eager to see will there be a race where stroll actually is able to take the fight to alonso you know match him in qualifying beat him there be up there in the race I don't know but just hopeful could this be that race imagine if in 2017 when Lance Stroll actually first came in we would be talking of something similar but looking at qualifying from Jeddah it seems like a possibility so don't quite rule that out 100% what i am actually very curious about in terms of winning hearts though kunal is what mercedes is going to do because remember <laughs> after bahrain they wrote such a heartfelt apology to all the fans as if we owed them something and then after south they able to try to play it up and they try to win all the hearts by saying that no 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 it's fernando's podium and we don't deserve it and they are the deserving winners at the end of the day so i am wondering at the end of this race at the end of the australian gp just what will mercedes do to try and win all of our hearts are they going to send toto wolf to rescue a kitten from the tree somewhere nearby albert albert <laughs> park because the way things are going right now they seem like more interested in winning our hearts than the races at all i mean you know for all the ferrari fans you must also be wondering what did we do wrong that we've never gotten a letter ourselves from ferrari itself because ferrari has been cocking up for ever since and you know going back to that 12 month chat i think ferrari's last most dominant win was in australia last year when you know of course you know verstappen had his retirement and then we were all like oh my god is like ferrari just going to run away with all of this and then we know how that whole thing transpired but sticking to mercedes uh sticking to the you know the silver arrows uh george russell he's been very positive we've spoken about it before uh what can he do what will he do lewis hamilton he has eight pole positions here but just two race wins i don't think he's going to add to either of those stats just yet and maybe another pr overdrive from mercedes on you know in in saudi and in bahrain we found a lot in 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 the wind tunnel but by the time we came to australia we found a lot in the time zone so we got more things from the wind tunnel i mean you know they will find things to keep uh chugging us along if i may call it that to to keep to keep feeding to their fan base about all the positivity and you know after all you have to keep managing your expectations of the fans as well so that's something that could happen but somil the one thing on my mind is you know by how much of a margin will red bull racing win this sunday because we saw in bahrain we saw in saudi arabia they were miles ahead of the rest i mean if you go back to bahrain even just having uh, the safety car and they were still pulling a, a you know a second a lap and they were finishing up ahead so how much more up the road can they finish will we see a you know a third team join uh any you know join the podium because we've seen a red bull and an aston martin or more like the red bull drivers and fernando alonso take the podium in the first two races could there just be a repeat of that for uh, you know the races in australia as well and uh, of course i'm sure at this point everyone will also keep chugging along or hyping up checo perez because he has done a great job he you know like uh, by all admission including christian honors uh, bahrain was his strongest race for red bull racing if at all so at all right so could that be uh, 
could that be actually the story coming up as well, Somil? So let's see how how much ahead on the road will you know sort of Red Bull Racing finish? Seriously, Kunal, I it's just a headache by this point already. Imagine two races into the season and you're just thinking, oh goodness, when will this end? Again, you can clearly tell I'm not a Red Bull Racing fan. Firstly, I I, I just like good racing, but. We could still end up seeing that, Kunal, because you're so right about that. Sergio Perez could well be in that hunt, in that fight. And I'm just thinking, right, after his amazing pace towards the end of that race, what if he just stitches that lap together in qualifying? What if he's just up ahead of Max Verstappen? And genuinely, we could get to see a fight on pace and on merit, Kunal. Do you think that will ever happen, though? Will Red Bull allow it? Well, at the moment, they're letting the drivers fight, which is what we saw in Bahrain. But... We are going to queue to F1 Stats Guru Stats Preview and just one last stat from me before we go there. So neither Max Verstappen nor Checo Perez have had a pole position at Albert Park or the Australian Grand Prix, right? In fact, Red Bull's last pole here was back in 2013 and I believe it was Sebastian Vettel. So it will be interesting to see if Red Bull is able to take pole and then sort of go ahead and win the race. And interestingly, you know, going back to Saudi, just for a reference, Red Bull Racing was actually the fastest across all the sessions, right? So uh, FP1, 2, 3, qualifying, and then the race. And I wonder if that could be sort of the new benchmark that they have, uh, you know, if, if that could be the new benchmark that they've accidentally created for themselves when it comes to, hey, how much more can we dominate in a season? Seriously, I I think it's just scary what they're doing at this moment in time. But let's just see what the numbers have to say about the upcoming Melbourne GP. So let's go to F1 Stats Guru for more. It's all about that initial stat, isn't it, Kunal? The 101st Formula 1 podium one. I know we've spoken about Aston Martin and Fernando Alonso initially, but my mind still inadvertently goes there. Because just thinking of that prospect after so many years of waiting, wow, (laughs) I'll have to calm myself down a little bit. But why don't we calm ourselves down by talking about Albert Park? Because this circuit, if you just watch all the onboards, if you watch all the races over here, it just makes you feel so serene, Kunal. Really, when I think about it constantly, I think Albert Park personally for me at least, has to be one of the best F1 street circuits that we've ever had. Not just for the fact that they do serve grandstand tickets that offer views of the circuit. They're not like Las Vegas, by the way, (laughs) who sell $500 tickets with no views of the circuit. I know it's like the snake pit at the Indianapolis 500. Yes, but there's that. There's the fact that we've got amazing green grass nearby. The layout is just fast and flowing and just Every single time, qualifying here is just beautiful. So, just just, just nice and warm feelings about Melbourne all the time. It is, and I actually didn't like the changes they made last year to turn 9 and 10. I loved that corner at the, you know, I love the barrier at the exit of the corner. But anyway, that's exactly. been changed. Yeah. But this is the 37th year in Australian Grand Prix is happening. And you said, is this by far the best street circuit? I don't know what the organizers at Baku or, or Saudi Arabia have to say. Everybody's trying to find these monikers, world's fastest street circuit and world's most green street circuit and world's most sustainable. And, you know, Baku will say world's most entertaining street circuit. But I agree. I mean, Australia comes as a street circuit, but also with a lot of heritage. So, you know, 20 years down the line, we'll probably look back at Baku with all the historic uh, heritage yeah. as well. But uh, importantly, Albert Park is the only circuit with four DRS zones. That's how much they are focusing on getting close action. It's not that easy out there. And to me, Albert Park always, you know, was like, that's what starts the season. But technically, you know, they don't pay as much as the Middle Eastern shakes do. So we have, uh, you know, the Middle Eastern races that start and end the season, right? And Albert Park has the circuit or has the rights to the Australian Grand Prix till 2037, right? So if Oscar Piastri is going to race in Formula 1 till 2037, which I really hope he does because it is his debut race, debut home race, the Australian fans will have a local driver to cheer all the way till then since Daniel Ricciardo is no longer there. And uh, talking of Piastri, McLaren are due their 400th podium. Uh, overall in Formula 1. I'm not sure it's coming this weekend. But, you know, the Piastri versus Norris battle took a turn for the good when Piastri outqualified Norris in Saudi Arabia. So, who could score McLaren's 400th podium, Samuel? 
Ha, it certainly doesn't look like it's going to be either of these two, considering the way the car has been going so far. But on that Oscar Piastri thing, well, it's interesting, isn't it, Kunal, that there has been an Australian driver on the grid every year since the year 2000. And so we come yet again to the Australian GP with a home driver. But you don't quite feel the same buzz as having someone like Mark Webber or Daniel Ricciardo. But I totally get it. It will build up over time. What we've seen with Oscar Piastri does seem to be very interesting, though. But I think if we have to end this episode on one note and one question, unfortunately, it's not going to be how many overtakes Oscar Piastri can make and where they qualify. Because considering their current form canal, by which lap will they DNF? Or how long will their pit stops be? I mean, McLaren were the fastest oh, yes. in the pit stops <laughs> in 22. And suddenly even the pit stops are in complete disarray. So let's see if McLaren are able to resurrect form. I mean, there are two teams yet to score points, Alpha Tauri and McLaren. In fact, McLaren are dead last in the Constructors' Championship. Will they be dead last even after the Australian Grand Prix? By which race will Alpha Tauri and McLaren also score points? And Interestingly, will this be yet another race where there are some or the other news from the Red Bull camp about Alpha Tauri? I mean, the latest news is, hey, we need to change the name of Alpha Tauri to something else for marketing reasons, right? So, hey, why did you change it from Toro Rosso to Alpha Tauri anyway? Because Checo Perez, oh, sorry, Sebastian Vettel anyway calls it an Al- a Toro Rosso. So, you know, just confusing us with all these names uh, and of course, driver lineups, given that they can change their driver lineups however they want. And, uh, you know, Wait, it's, w- go on. What's the new name going to be, Kunal? Have they given any indication? Red Bull sister team? Because <laughs> they went from being a B team to a sister team, but their performances went down to being a D team. So I'm not pretty sure of that. <laughs> And, uh, you know, qualifying, let's let's see how qualifying lines up because the last three races have seen three different pole sitters, if I remember. And, uh, the you know, the last three races have also been, bu- bu- been won by three different drivers. There was Leclerc, Bottas, and then Fettel. And the last three races in Australia have also been won from position one, two, and three. So interesting numbers out there. And in fact... Raikkonen's win in 2013, which was with Lotus, he won from 7th on the grid. So it'll be interesting to see how qualifying sort of lines up and if any of the you know drivers are out of place. And when I say any of the drivers, it typically means if the Red Bull racing drivers end up being out of place, right? Because up until now in 22, only the Red Bull drivers have scored a pole position, right? But another interesting anomaly, Samuel, is that while Ferrari have botched up several other things... They have been the quickest in the pit stops. They've done a 2.2 and a 2.1 pit stop. So it doesn't matter, you know, uh, when they pit because their usual challenge is when they pit. But when they have pitted in 23, they've registered the fastest pit stop of a race. Have they? (laughs) Interesting. So things are moving at least in some right direction. But it's good to see generally. But... Again, it's all about that hoping game with Ferrari at this stage, isn't it, Kunal? Where we're all just waiting for that performance to come. And so, uh, just for the sake of putting his name out there, I know we all tend to forget about him every single time. We've also forgotten that he's a Grand Prix winner. But I just want to put his name so that we don't forget he exists. Carlos Sainz. Good. We've got his name in the episode. Brilliant. But uh, on the subject of Ferrari, I'm intrigued to see how... Charles Leclerc gets disappointed this weekend as well because something or the other, unfortunately, is ending up going wrong. But I certainly hope that doesn't quite happen this time because Jeddah looked intriguing. Tire wear is going to be an interesting topic as well over here, Kunal, because Alex Albon last year managed to get a monster stint out of his tyres at Albert Park. And that is genuinely a very, very hard thing to do at this circuit. And I think the big buzzword we're also going to hear from all the drivers is going to be the the following, because it becomes so hard to follow over here at the street circuit. And normally, gaps do tend to open up and drivers have to manage their tyres. But to what extent will they have to with these new cars? I'm, I'm pretty intrigued by that. But that just makes me wonder, who will be following the other person? Perez or Verstappen? Who's your money on, Canal? Because I, at this time, am betting for another Perez win, weirdly. Wow. I hope a Perez win as well. I mean, it's lovely to just see Verstappen be challenged. He's extremely superior in the car and if Perez actually is able to match him and beat him of course I know this is where Verstappen fans will be like but hey dude remember he had like a 
you know, he started 15th. And I understand that. I mean, you know, but it's great to see if there are just going to be two drivers competing that we have two drivers competing, right? But talking of the tire, you know, Oscar Piastri ran the hard tire for all but the opening lap in the last race as well. So, you know, tire antics and tire strategy will be something we can see. I also want to ask this question. What next will the FIA do to interfere with the regular narratives of a Grand Prix? Because they always find these things, you know, they'll either give a penalty, take it back, or give a, you know, penalty later on in hindsight, etc., etc. So it's all down to understanding what next could the FIA do. And one of the things you spoke of following that I think is already seeds being pruned for, a, you know, uh, seeds being sown for what could ha- could be a mid-season change or a directive that comes in is, you know, Verstappen and Leclerc both said in Saudi Arabia that following was an issue and, you know, ghosts of 2021 actually came back to them when they couldn't really, f- you know, follow other cars and the wake was sort of bothering them and stuff like that, right? Uh so will that be something that we hear more of in Australia? That's something I'm eager to hear of, that hey, it's becoming increasingly difficult to follow cars, even though these are ground effect cars, because the teams have clawed back a lot of aerodynamic loss via their aerodynamic surfaces, right? So, And then, of course, will a team get a time penalty three times out of three races? Three times out of three races, will a driver be outside of the start grid and they then get a start grid infringement penalty? So lots of things to look forward to this weekend, apart from, of course, the fact that the race is an absolute different time zone and this is where, uh, you know, if you guys go back to our episode last year with Michael Italiano, he explained how, uh, you know, drivers cope with time zones and there is a jet lag protocol uh, and and very fascinating stuff. This is why you need to keep listening to the Inside Line F1 podcast. We normally have some exciting stories all the time. Exactly. And in April, we're going to have David Coulthard on the podcast as well. We're going to have Driven International. They explain how they actually come up with all these amazing circuits like Yas Marina and the Hyderabad Street Circuit. And also a couple of other really interesting guests, including, well, I think I'll keep it a suspense, actually. Let's wait for that episode to drop and then I'll tell you who's going to come on the show. But let's hope that this is a good weekend where we get to see some good racing. And let's just hope that Red Bull Racing are finally able to crack their biggest challenge of the entire weekend. Which member of the team actually goes up to collect the Constructors' Trophy? Should be fun, this one. It will. And if Max Verstappen is on the podium this weekend, he would have scored his 80th podium in Formula 1. Which means that he would equal Aton Senna's tally of 80 poles. So there will be a bit of sentiment around that. Verstappen, if I remember correctly, is five race wins away from Ayrton Senna's total race wins tally in Formula 1. So I expect that to also sort of somewhere tally uh, in the season. And then will we see yet another podium without a Ferrari or Mercedes on it? And I think, again, F1 Stats Guru had a brilliant stat around this. We've seen the first two races without a Ferrari or a Mercedes on the podium. Will it be a third and will there be a new stat around that? Leclerc is waiting for his 25th career podium in Formula 1. I get this feeling he's going to have to wait a little longer than this Sunday. Let's hope so. Let's hope that in the end, whatever happens, we get to see a good race after quite a while. Thank you then, folks, for listening to our Australian GP preview. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, leave a good rating, and share this episode with other friends and family members who would love listening more about Formula 1 as well. Until then, have a fun time, enjoy the race and we shall be back on Monday.